Well, let's get started. It's 501. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Melanie Brooks and I am the audience coordinator at the BDN. Thank you for joining us tonight for our BDN events online meetup with Maine Secretary of State, Matt Dunlap. And I have a wonderful co-host tonight. It's State House reporter, Jessica Piper. I'm really excited to have her here as part of this event. Um, for those of you who are here that are subscribers, I just wanted to say a big thank you. Some of you I've noticed have been to our events before and I appreciate you coming back. Um, it's your support that keeps us being able to do these um, events for everybody for free. So I really appreciate it. And um, as we get going, um, Secretary of State Matt Dunlap is right here in Old Town and I'm in Orono. He is Maine's 49th Secretary of State. He is now serving his fourth consecutive and seventh overall term in office. And he is the first person to serve non-consecutive terms as Secretary of State since 1880. So a little fun fact about our special guest. I'm going to pass the baton over to Jessica and she will take over and ask our Secretary of State some questions and that and then about 5.30, 5.25, 5.30, we're going to open it up to your questions. So if you think of something, drop it in that chat box and we will get to it. So thank you. Go ahead, Jessica. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Secretary Dunlap, thanks for being here with us. Um, I think the thing we wanted to start with, which is at the top of a lot of people's minds, is the upcoming primary election on July 14th. I'm wondering if you could address a little bit just to start. What about the primary is going to look different this year compared to previous years? And what, what elements of the primary will look mostly the same? That's a great question. It's one that we've been getting an awful lot, as you might imagine. And really, the biggest change is the change of the date. Uh, we began talking about what elements we'd have to address for the primary election right after the governor declared the state of civil emergency back about the middle of March. And we began thinking, you know, we are, this is only going to get more intense. So we should probably think about what adjustments we need to make for the primary election. And you know, we had just finished with the uh, presidential primary on March 3rd. So that gave us a little bit of, of, a, of a weather gauge as to how much interest there's going to be in this election cycle. And it seems to be pretty high. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we afforded every citizen the opportunity to vote uh, and do so without any impediment and to do so without any fear of either the, the coronavirus or not being able to participate in the election at all. So we started talking about a, a bunch of different ideas that we kicked around with the governor. We had several meetings with the governor. I've known the governor for a long, long time. So I was used to the intense questioning that she put to us about what the ramifications of some of these proposals would be. So what it boiled down to was really uh, pushing out the date of the election. We had talked about an increased use of absentee ballots. In fact, we had suggested doing the, the election predominantly by absentee, with the exceptions, of course, for people who may have dexterity issues or visual issues. For those folks, under the Help America Vote Act, we have provided them the accessible voting system, which is a sort of electronic solution that's in every polling station that allows people to vote privately and without assistance who might have some of those issues and produces a paper ballot for them to then submit to the election official. Uh, we'd still want to be able to do that. And also because Maine has election day registration, there's no deadline. We also need a place for people to go to register to vote. So um, with all that in mind, um, the, the governor opted to push the election out. Um, and part of our concern is, as it developed was we have a lot of town offices now that are not open. Um, some, in some cases, they're not even working in them. So that was part of the concern of the absentee ballot push for June, is that if people were, were not in those town offices to actually issue the ballots and then accept them upon their return, uh, what we were proposing wouldn't work. So the obvious solution was to push the election out and the governor agreed to do that. And we selected July 14th, Bastille Day, and uh, that's the biggest change that we're going to see. Also, in a couple of other minor changes, the governor also removed any deadlines around absentee balloting. For about the last eight years, we've had a two business day deadline before the election to request an absentee ballot for no 
other reason other than you want one. And after that, you'd have to have some contingency that dropped in your lap, like you had to go to the hospital or you had an unexpected business trip. Um, still could get the absentee ballot, but then needed a reason. That barrier was removed so that now people can request and receive absentee ballots anytime up to and including election day. And uh, mail-in voter registration deadline has been shortened from 21 days mailed in to seven. Now, all that being said, we are still encouraging people to take care of this stuff early on. Uh, don't wait till the last minute to register to vote and mail it in. Don't wait, uh, if you have an absentee ballot, don't mail it in on Monday because it may not get to the town hall in time to be counted. All absentee ballots, regardless of any of the adjustments we made, must be received and be in the possession of the town clerk by 8 p.m. on election night. So that's really pretty much it's the same as every election. It's just that we moved the dates and took care of some of the deadlines. I know you and town clerks across the state have been urging voters to vote absentee, but for voters who decide to go to the polls on July 14th, what sort of health precautions will there be? Well, we're, all, we're going to continue to embrace the Centers for Disease Control social distancing guidelines. We have received some money from the federal government under the CARES Act for elections, and it has to be COVID related in order to use it. So one of the things that we're using it for is we're providing personal protective equipment for all the poll workers, along with some plexiglass barriers, face shields, masks, and that sort of thing so that uh, the poll workers uh, can, can work in the polling stations with a sense of comfort and security. Uh, we're also encouraging folks if they come to vote in person to also wear masks. We're not demanding it. And we're not gonna turn anyone away from the polls if they're not wearing a mask um, because people do have an affirmative right to vote. But uh, just bear in mind that we still are in the grip of a pandemic and uh, this is, these are the guidelines that have worked so far pretty well for us and we think we should continue to follow them. Um, so if you choose, or for some reason, can't get an absentee ballot, you waited too long, or you put down the wrong address to send it to, and it went to your summer house instead of your main address, any reason, um, you can still come into the polls and vote on election day. And I think with the social distancing rules, uh, I think we'll be okay. Um, some states have made efforts to, for example, send absentee ballot request forms to every voter. Why didn't Maine do something like that? Well, a couple of reasons. And we talked, we still talked about it even this week, um, how that was going to play out. Um, and one of the reasons why we didn't is because, uh, we need, first of all, we need an executive order to do that. And the reason for that is in the law, the law stipulates uh, the first words are upon request. So the voter has to actually ask for it. So we need an executive order to waive that component where the voter had to initiate the, the inquiry for an absentee ballot. And then to send an absentee ballot request form to every address in the state of Maine, we estimated would cost us about half a million dollars. Um, now we're estimating turnout for this primary to be probably north of 20%. Um, maybe around 25% higher than normal because we've had a lot of focus on this particular primary election, along with a lot of uh, urgent messages from, a, from organizations like AARP and the League of Women Voters for people to vote by absentee, which we think will bump up turnout. So we've been preparing by printing more ballots to face that, um, but still 25% turnout uh, would be relatively low. Now that, that cost to send all those absentee ballot requests, the half million dollars, is basically the equivalent of what it costs us to run the rest of the primary. So um, we talked to the governor about it and depending on where we are come the fall, hopefully most of this is behind us, but if there is a resurgence of the coronavirus, uh, we would save that revenue in the federal allotment and do such do a similar request probably for the November election where we expect much, much higher turnout, probably north of 70 to 75%. And we've heard some political figures claim that absentee voting is more likely to be subject to voter fraud. Can you address that and discuss what steps Maine takes in order to ensure that voter fraud doesn't happen? Voter fraud is a common concern around all mail or absentee voter elections, absentee ballot elections. Um, but what we find is that with the process that we use, that we try to assure that we maintain a chain of custody. 
So it, it's actually very easy to get an absentee ballot. You can call down to the city hall and say, I'm Jessica Piper and I'd like to get an absentee ballot. You can get on our absentee ballot request service online that we have as part of our website. And that is directed straight to your town clerk. You can print off the form or get a form down at the town hall, fill it out and give it to one of the clerk staff. Um, you can designate a third party, including a relative, to go get an absentee ballot for you. It, it always revolves around the request. So we have a form, uh, presuming that you fill it out yourself and sign it, um, or you have someone pick it up for you, or the clerk denotes that you have requested this form. Then the package is put together, the ballot, the return envelope, and then the sending envelope. It's all sealed and it's sent to you, however you designate. If you ask for it to be mailed to you, then it's sent to you in the mail or whatever other means. When you get it, you open the envelope, you take out your ballot, you can mark it in the comfort of your own home, and then you put it in the return envelope and you seal it and you sign it. And that is when we process the absentee ballots, what goes into that is that whatever time they process absentee ballots, I say that because the larger communities will actually process early. Like Portland will start a day or two in advance because they'll have upwards of 10,000 absentee ballots to process. They'll take the envelope and they'll announce Jessica Piper at 123 Wagon Wheel Lane. Um, and they check that name off the incoming voter list. They open the ballot, take the ballots out. They put them in a pile of other ballots. That envelope is kept with your form. So that's kept for like six months or some such time. And then the ballots are all shuffled together to preserve the privacy of the vote. And they're folded to preserve the privacy of the vote. And then they're cast um, once they've been opened and processed. The tallies are not run till after eight o'clock on election night. So there's a pretty rigorous paper process is what I'm saying. And um, you know, especially if the voter themselves has filled out the form, we will look to see if the signatures resemble each other. If they've done it by the phone, the clerk can check the, the, the signature on file on your voter registration card. It doesn't have to be an exact match, but it should look like yours. Um, and uh, that I think does an awful lot to preserve the integrity of the process. Chain of custody is something that we lean very, very heavily on so that we can speak with authority about who is handling ballots from the time they leave the printing press to when they're sealed in the ballot box at the end of the election on election day. Um, you, you, when you talk about another proposal, this is a question you haven't asked, but I'm gonna answer it anyway, because I wanna get ahead of myself a little bit. Another proposal we've had is why not just send an absentee ballot to every registered voter? What a great idea. That's what they do in Oregon, right? They send all mail elections. Well, Oregon has a somewhat different process. First of all, they have a registration deadline and they have opportunities for people to affirm their registrations. They also have closed primaries. I mean, I'm sorry, we have closed primaries. They have open primaries. So voters all get the same ballot. In Maine, on, under a closed primary system, only Democrats get the Democratic primary ballot. Only Republicans get the Republican primary ballot. Everybody gets the referendum ballot. So that would be really tough to sort out in an all-male election. Now, the apocryphal tale that I tell about the danger of sending abs absentee ballots to all registered voters. I had a state representative from one of our cities after the last election contact me and said, I think there's something wrong with the voter list. It's got errors in it. And I said, why do you say that? And they said, well, and they did this legally. They did a constituent mailing about all the services they can get from their legislative delegation using their copy of the voter list. Um, this is permissible under the law. Um, and they sent it out to like 6,000 households. Well, 700 of them came back as undeliverable. This is in February. It's right after the election. So there must be something wrong. So I said, well, bring them in. So they bring me this grocery bag filled with all this returned mail, returned undeliverable. So we take stacks of envelopes, we open up the center voter registration system, and we go start matching them up. 100% match. All those address matches. All those addresses match. And so what we were able to divine from that was it in that particular town, that city, that legislative district, people tend to move a lot. They may stay in an apartment for th three to six months, their circumstances change or they get a better arrangement and they move. And usually when people move, this may come as a shock to everyone. The last thing they think about is their voter registration. They don't think about that till election day. And it's like, oh yeah, I've got to update my voter registration. 
So, um, you know, if you were to send those absentee ballots to all those addresses, a lot of them would be dead addresses or they'd get to voters who didn't, who, who weren't entitled to them. So that would, I think, speak to the concerns about all mail elections. If you, we don't have that type of refined mechanism that they have in Oregon or in Washington state, which many of their counties use all mail. And I talked to the secretary of state, Kim Wyman, and she said, we have a great system, but it took us 15 years to develop. So that's why we're just working with the tools that we have and absentee ballots have a very rigorous uh, whole process for chain of custody. And I think it works well and that's what we're gonna lean on for this election cycle. Does counting absentee ballots potentially take longer than counting ballots cast on election day? And should we expect to see election results on election night? You will probably see election results on election night, at least some preliminary results. And this is something that, um, this is always the first question we get at five minutes after eight, who won? And uh, you'll have preliminary results. You'll have unofficial results. Now, it depends on the community, especially you have, we have something like 240 communities that count their ballots by hand because they're smaller towns, fewer than a thousand voters, and they'll sort those ballots and they'll count them by hand. And it takes maybe an hour or two to do. Um, but in the towns that have the DS200 tabulating machines, they have a pretty good idea of what their results are gonna be within usually minutes of the election. Absentee ballots do slow that down a bit, depending on the community, if they choose to process early, some of them will start right, they'll have a separate crew processing absentee ballots, which by the way, is a public process. It's not done in a, in a closed room. You can watch absentee ballots being processed and you can hear the names being announced. And you can challenge those just as voters can challenge the eligibility of any voter at the polls on election day. So it's a public process. And um, if they do it ahead of time and they have them all processed and, and cast, then if they're using tabulators, then yes, it'll, you'll get the unofficial results about the same time that you get the results for the in-person voting. If they wait till after the polls are closed, it may take a little bit longer. Um, but that depends on the community. But yes, I think we should expect at least some unofficial results uh, on election night. We saw with the presidential primary on, on March 3rd that some voters had voted absentee for a candidate who then dropped out like two days before election day. Um, are there any drawbacks like that to voting absentee for this upcoming primary? That is an issue and it's one that the legislature has really wrestled with. Um, you know, going back to the 2010 uh, gubernatorial election, uh, and, and I, there is still the PhDs yet to be awarded over the study of that particular election cycle. Um, but for people who remember how that all shook out over that September and October before the general election, it was very much a scrum. And the numbers in the polls weren't really moving. And then the, that little trickle of stones turned into an avalanche. And um, we had a, a surge of voters uh, moving towards Elliot Cutler. And the Cutler campaign was urging people to go to their town clerk if they voted absentee and they had not voted for Elliot Cutler but wanted to, to say that they had spoiled their ballot and they wanted a new ballot. And uh, the legislature took a long look at that and said, we don't have enough ballots for people to change their minds in the election. So that once you submit an absentee ballot now, it's gone. So there is no opportunity to get a new ballot and vote a, a different way if your candidate, like say like Amy Klobuchar, for example, dropped out the Saturday before the presidential primary, she had a not insubstantial following. Um, but those, those votes for her did not count because she had dropped out. Um, that is, that's one of the drawbacks. You know, one, of the, one of the positives about absentee balloting, campaigns uh, can access the file of who has requested absentee ballots. And you'll notice that the phone will ring and ring and ring and ring three or four times a night. And then when you return the absentee ballot, all of a sudden your house gets very quiet because you know, it's not a live ballot anymore. It's been, it's been turned in. Um, so that's, you know, there are pros and cons to turning in your absentee ballot, um, but that's definitely a con. If you, if you vote for a candidate who drops out, then there's no calling it back. Um, one more question I want to ask before we maybe turn it over to our, our listeners is, 
Maine is a little bit behind other states when it comes to census response we've seen so far this spring. You had to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> I had to bring that up. Um, I'm curious if you could address that and talk about what the state might do to try to bring our response numbers up. Well, I am the chair of the state's complete count committee, and this is something that we've been watching really with a weather eye. And the census has struggled with the coronavirus pandemic just as much as the rest of us. Of course, this year, uh, people can respond online, and a great many did. But, you know, it also speaks to the lack of broadband access around the rural areas of the state. And uh, when you talk to the census folks about how they go about counting people in rural areas, they actually have, you know, the maps, sections of maps designated as Alaska, simply because rural areas like northern Piscataquis County, uh, southern and western Aroostook County, um, it's almost as hard to get there as you'd have to get to, you know, Kodiak Island. Um, so they employ a lot of people going out and canvassing door to door. My father-in-law worked as a supervisor in the last census, and he really struggled to root out people who just did not want to respond to the census. And it's incredibly important that people do. You know, we talked about the CARES Act money that we've gotten. That's an allocation based on population. So if people don't respond to the census, then we're leaving on the table billions of dollars in federal highway funds, education funds, human services funds, transportation, you name it. And that's our tax money that we're leaving for some other state to get a hold of. So uh, we've been encouraging people to, to get online at census2020.gov. If you haven't done it, if you've never seen it before, I guarantee you it will not take you longer than five minutes. The census is re-gearing to get canvassers back out on the road um, and they pay, I think it is 58 cents a mile and $20 an hour if you're looking for work um, to, to do this type of thing, to go to those areas where people have not responded and just get a head count on how many people live at a given address. Uh, there's a lot of questions about the, what we ask on the census, like you know some of the uh, general financial information. You know, no one will ever ask you for your checking account information or credit card information. If they do, they're trying to steal from you. The census will not ask for that information. So uh, we're going to be ramping that up. I know the census is already looking at uh, a delayed release of the final numbers for the decennial census into the middle of next year, which causes a lot of us some concern about how Congress is going to react to that and the legislatures. But uh, we're just it's, a, it's just a new day and uh, we're dealing with that just as we are with our elections processes, motor vehicle processes and everything else we do in government. Thank you so much, Jessica, for those really good questions. And Matt, thanks for those wonderful answers. Um, I'm gonna share some things that have come in through the chat. Um, Doug Dunbar just wanted to give you a shout out. Um, he said, having been fortunate to serve as Deputy Secretary of State, He'd like to acknowledge Matt's good work and recognize the great staff in the elections division. Many thanks to all of them. Well, Doug, Doug is an incredible talent and he has been doing some really tremendous work in the last couple of years on, on jail reform and he is a voice that's worth listening to. Yes, and I told Matt specifically that he did not have to pay attention to the chat. So I just wanted to read that out loud so he could hear it. <laughs> um, Paul had a question that I was also wondering. Um, do the CDC guidelines suggest disinfecting areas after each use for going to the polls? So will poll workers be spraying stations after each use? Will they be changing pens? What might that look like? Well, certainly probably be changing pens and cleaning them. Um, in terms of cleaning the individual polling stations, I think we have to kind of deal with that as we go along and observe what we have for resources like disinfectant wipes that sort of thing. Wipes, anybody who's been trying to get wipes, if you find them, let me know, because I've been looking for them for about two months, can't find any. We were able to get a bunch um, that uh, we're letting our, uh, we're actually not letting, we're asking our motor vehicle examiners to use when they're doing road tests to wipe down door handles and, and uh, armrests and dashboards and such like that. Um, you think about germs in an entirely different way in a pandemic. And uh, so depending on the, the availability of those types of resources, whatever we can get in for the PPE, we may ask for that type of work to be done if possible. Uh, otherwise, we'll have some hand sanitizer and people can hand sanitize their hands coming in and going out. 
Um, but uh, no two polling stations are exactly alike. So it's hard to say in a uniform way exactly what we're going to be able to expect uh, on election day. Vote by absentee, that'll help. Sure. So <laughs> Claudia wants to know if she requests an absentee ballot this week, when she might anticipate receiving them in the mail? Well, um, they're going to be mailed out for those who've already requested. And the requests are really important. I'm glad Claudia asked that because the requests, um, you know, a lot of people asked for their, requested their absentee ballot, understanding how the law works, um, 90 days before the June primary. And the law says you can't ask for one sooner than 90 days. Well, as part of one of the governor's original executive orders on this matter was that if you'd already requested one, you didn't have to ask for it again. So uh, anybody who's requested an absentee ballot in this time period, um, they will be mailed out on June 12th. Now, they're available generally, this is the vagary of the calendar. Uh, they're supposed to be available 30 days in advance of the election, but 30 days in advance of the election happens to be Sunday, June 14th. So they're gonna be mailed out on June 12th. So people should, who've already requested them should be expecting them that week. Uh, and again, they have to be turned back in by 8 p.m. on election night. Is there a deadline to requesting an absentee ballot? There is no deadline. Um, however, if you expect to get it and return it by mail, you ought to allow yourself a little bit of extra time, like probably 10 days or at least a week, uh, so they can get to you and be returned in time if you're voting completely by mail. Uh, you have to allow, because the Postal Service is overwhelmed as well, because they are observing the same guidelines in every, as everyone else. Um, I've been doing some more overseas correspondence and some of that mail comes back once in a while and I asked the Postal Service about it and they basically said, said to me, are you kidding? Um, every, everybody's dealing with this. So I would uh, take that um, into consideration when you're asking for an absentee ballot and give yourself plenty of time. Um. Claudia also wanted to know if um, how many absentee ballots have been received by your office and how you think it will compare to the last election. So far we've received none because we haven't issued them yet. So um, the overseas and military ballots are available 45 days prior to the election. And we even take the extra step of uh, under the military and overseas voter empowerment act, allowing for electronic transmission of blank ballots. Um, that's an entirely different process that voters here don't have to really think about, but it was a great reform um, spurred partly, and I was, I was on the board of directors of the old Overseas Vote Foundation, and um, you, know, you don't think about American citizens from Maine living abroad, people in Afghanistan in a rifle pit or on a guided missile destroyer somewhere in the Persian Gulf, but they get to vote too. And I had gotten a call, an email actually, from a former legislator the day before the election. They were teaching in Pakistan in a rural remote village, knew the process, requested their absentee ballot 90 days in advance. It showed up the day before the election. And there was really no way to get that back. We thought, well, if you can get to the embassy, they have a secure fax machine. And you could fax it to the town office and they said, that's, a, that's out a donkey trail 150 miles from here. So it wasn't possible. So we really began working on this. And uh, for the military in particular and, and other expatriates abroad, the MOVE Act allows for that electronic transmission. Um, but for everybody else, domestic absentees are still handled largely by mail. Um, or if you happen, like, like I, I live probably less than a half mile from my city hall, I can walk down and get it if I wish to. So um, that's the process that seems to work most efficiently. But um, that's uh, something to bear in mind is that whole mail thing, which mm -hmm. I answered way more than what you asked. That's fine. Um, do you have any idea of how many requests for ballots that you've received? It tends to work on a ramp. So uh, we have, I don't have the numbers for this week yet, um, but it tends to come in, you know, you have the diehards um, who vote, um, who, who always request an absentee ballot, um, that number will accelerate vastly here over the next four weeks. Um, and, but I don't have the numbers right now. They're, they're about what we would track. The last I looked at it, which I think was Monday, and I don't remember what that number was, but it was tracking about what we'd expect for a primary election. And this kind of gets back to Jessica's question about the, the primary in March. Um, we got that prediction way wrong. 
And, um, you know, when people, you know, reporters ask me all the time, what's turnout going to look like, Mr. Secretary? And, and I'll say 20%. Well, if it's 21.2%, I usually get, you know, the crooked finger, you were wrong. And I say, well, you know, our tea leaves are store brand, what can we say? But, you know, we do make these intelligent estimates based on past tur turnout in similar elections, because no two elections are alike. If, if you have an off year election, that's only maybe, you know, only, only a bond question, which is incredibly important, but just that one bond question, turnout could be under 10%. Um, but then you have uh, an, an open seat for the president of the United States. Well, now you're knocking on 75% of eligible voters. Incredible turnout. Um, and then everything in between. What we were looking at in March for turnout was something probably around fairly pedestrian turnout, 15 to 25%, what we see in every primary. Plus, we've never done a March primary for the presidential race before. So it was a little bit of groping in the dark. So as you know, I travel around the polls on election day and I visit with town clerks and those towns that have the fire department or town library bake sale. I come away with a lot of goods. And uh, uh, you know, we see what, we answer questions, we interact with voters. And, and um, we got, the first place I got to after I voted in Old Town, drove all the way down to Southern Maine went to the town of Arundel. Arundel's a small town. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, they told me, well, we've had almost 375 people vote. So I called the deputy, Julie Flynn, and I said, Julie, the playbook is now officially out the window. This is gonna be a heavy turnout. And it was, it was actually closer to 40%. And I think that speaks to the unforeseen factor, like uh, Jessica mentioned, when uh, those couple of those major presidential candidates dropped out the weekend before, it kind of crystallized the choices in the Democratic primary and people went out to vote. So we don't always, we don't always know what factors are going to contribute to either higher or lower turnout. I think it was down in Scarborough um, one year, they had almost 95% turnout. It was crazy. Well, it turned out they had an ordinance, a local ordinance on the ballot about leashing your dog. And it had everybody in town at each other's throats. So they were going to go out and vote for that election. It had nothing to do with what we were doing, urging people to turn out to vote. So, um, but whatever gets people engaged, we just try to provide the mechanism for them to vote. Sure. Um, we've heard from a couple of our readers uh, about Maine being a closed primary state. And Maine has a pretty good um, percentage of independent voters and they cannot participate in primary elections without registering in one of the two, um, without registering in a party. So what steps are required for Maine to become an open primary state? How does that work? It'd be very simple. You need a law change by the legislature. And this is the challenge with changing election law, is that the people who you're asking to change the laws regarding elections got elected with the laws that were already there and it worked pretty well for them. So, um, you know, and this is something that I, we do hear about. And you're right, it, it, it's not that they can't participate. They can't participate in the primary without joining the party. And a lot of people don't want to join a party, especially the law says that once you join the party, you have to stay in the party for 90 days. You just can't go in and then drop out on the way out the door. That's not the way it works. And in open primary states, and California takes it a step further, they have, a, in some jurisdictions, they have what they call a jungle primary, which is whoever the top two finishers are face off in the general election. So you could have two Democrats facing each other, two Republicans facing each other in the general election. Um, you know, open primaries, you can, you get the ballot with all the candidates on it and you just pick the ones you want, uh, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, Greens, Libertarians, et cetera. So it would require a law change, require legislation to be adopted by the legislature. And until that happens, we're gonna stay a closed primary state. So that's all I have to offer on that. <laughs> I hear you. Um, Michael wanted to know that given that social distancing draws out the time to do anything in public, um, will the polls be open for longer as it might take people longer to vote? Nope. Uh, the law says, actually the constitution says that the polls close at eight o'clock. So we can't, uh, the only time we've left a polling station open longer than that was in Bangor about 12 years ago in the general election when they had multiple polling stations and somebody pulled the fire alarm at Bangor High School in the middle of the afternoon, just as the rush started. And there was basically the polls were not accessible for about 45 minutes while the fire department dealt with that. 
Um, one of the campaigns went to court and they sued me. I get sued a lot. Um, we can have a separate Zoom call about lawsuits sometime. And uh, they prevailed upon the Superior Court judge who issued an injunction to keep that, poll that polling station open until 9 p.m. Um, and I was happened to be there and we closed the polling station at 9 p.m. Not a single voter walked in the door, by the way. Um, so they close at eight. There's been no discussion. I don't think there's a mechanism to keep them open later than that. They typically, the polls open typically at 7 a.m. Um, some of the small towns can open as late as 10. Everybody closes at eight. So, and this is another reason why we encourage people to vote by absentee. So you don't have to worry about that line, especially also if you're not registered or if you've moved since the last election, take care of it. Get that voter registration updated. Uh, again, um, if you have concerns about social distancing, um, standing in line for any length of time, I think makes people nervous in this climate. So um, it takes just a few minutes to get that updated um, and it's worth doing. What about the volunteers at the polls that you depend on? Um, some people might be nervous about volunteering during um, this pandemic. Have you seen any instances where you might not have enough volunteers? I know the town clerks are very concerned about this and we've been working with some of the big nonprofits trying to encourage people uh, who have not volunteered at the polls before to do so. Um, you know, the demographic of people who volunteer as poll workers is typically among those who are retired and that's a very, very risky group in the coronavirus. And I know that there's a number of city clerks that have been very, very worried about this, especially those with multiple polling stations. I think there's about 11 towns left in Maine that don't have, that have more than one polling station. I think Portland has 11, for example. So um, that's an area of concern. So we've been trying to help towns recruit younger people. Um, and when I have this conversation, people will usually ask, you know, how do we volunteer? Well, I'll tell you how you volunteer. You call your town clerk and ask if they need any help. Now, work at the polls can be complicated, but there are those tasks which are not so complicated. So like voter registration can get a little bit sticky. If somebody walks in at five minutes of eight on election night and they didn't bring their wallet and they don't have anything with their address on it, how do you deal with that? Well, there is a way, but it takes a little training and it takes some experience. So, so if you can get some volunteers to maybe work as ballot clerks and have the patience to sit there as people walk in and find their name on the voter list and check them off and then you know you hand them their ballot and then if they go um, or on the other end as people are casting their ballots um, you know that's a huge amount of help for the clerks and uh, all you have to do is ask and I'm sure they'll find something for you to do to help out. Yeah that would be great. Um, we did have a question come in from Michael and he wants to know if you use the typewriter behind you. Here we are in technology Zoom and you have this lovely typewriter with paper in it. Well, I, I, yes, I do use, I have a couple of these. I have one here at home and I have one in my, in my office. I got them um, at yard sales and they work marvelously. And you know, when I have to think something out very carefully, I like to use the typewriter. And so when I have to draft um, people's veto or a citizen initiative question, they all start on these machines. <laughs> and that's true, that's an actual fact. To give your fingers a workout, it's harder to use those keys. I can work um, when the power goes out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, we just got a question in from Sean. He just um, sold his home and have moved to um, their place at the lake. We are receiving our mail at our son's home in the same town we have lived in for over 30 years. Can we claim our son's residence for the purposes of voting? That's a great question. And this gets into the most common question that we have around election is, where do I vote? And, you know, this is, I, I, just, to, just to inform the answer, I had a fellow call me some years ago, and he lived somewhere, I think, just outside of, of uh, Newark, New Jersey. And he had, was complaining because he had called uh, Fort Fairfield's town office and they would not send him an absentee ballot. And I said, okay, well, um, where do you live in Fort Fairfield? Well, I don't live in Fort Fairfield. 
Well, you can't vote, you know, but his family had owned a farm there for three generations and he felt this kinship and he wanted to vote there. And well, you don't choose where you vote, you choose where you live. So, and it's where you live for the foreseeable future. Now, before we came on uh, the, the Zoom live, um, uh, I was asked, you know, how long I'd lived in Old Town. And I said, you know, my usual flip answer was I moved here for one academic year, actually it was supposed to be one academic semester as a grad student at the University of Maine. That was 31 years ago. I never planned on staying here, but I did. And after about a year, I, that one semester turned to two and then three, now we're coming up on election. And I wanted, you know, my parents ingrained in me the importance of voting. So I went down to city halls. So like, I don't know when I'm leaving, but I'm gonna go vote. So I go down to city hall and I register to vote. And, um, and I think, you know, this is, this is a question we get from people like Sean. So Sean, if you're staying at your son's house and that's where you're getting your mail, and that's where you're gonna be for some indeterminate amount of time into the future, then yeah, you can register and you can vote there. Um, or you can vote from your camp at the lake or wherever, um, you know, because you don't know, you may want to be in there for a while. Now you may not want to be, um, but that's the reality. On the other hand, Melanie, you live in Orno, right? Um, you might get a call tomorrow from the Chicago Tribune. Now you're planning on staying there. The Bangor Daily News is a great gig, but what if the Chicago Tribune calls and they said, we want you to be our executive editor? Well, you know, I'd like to think you're smart enough to not to pass up an opportunity. You're probably gonna get on a plane and you're gonna fly to Chicago. But for the time being, you intend to be where you are. And that's where you register to vote and that's where you vote. And the same is true for college students. We got a lot of questions about college students in the time of the pandemic. And the question we ask in response is, do I vote at the campus or do I vote with my parents? It's like, where do you plan on being? Do you plan on going back? It's wherever you intend to return when temporarily absent from. So if you don't plan on coming back to campus and you're gonna be at your parents' house and you vote at your parents' house. But if you're going back to campus, you are well within your rights to request an absentee ballot from the Orono town clerk if you're gonna go back to the University of Maine in the fall. So that's a quick primer on residency and voting. It's complicated, doesn't it? I wish it was easy, but it's not. I know. Um, so it's about quarter of, no, it's about quarter of, child, um, wants a snack, it's getting to be dinner time, I get it. Um, Sorry. <laughs> you know, so I wanted to know, you know, you've heard from me, you've heard from Jessica. Um, does anybody else want to share a comment or a question from the group? Um, I can, you can just raise your hand. Um, I can unmute you um, and let you go. Brenda will let. Let's get you, ask you to unmute. I am going to go ahead and yeah. Um, there you go. Go ahead, Brenda. What's your question? Well, first of all, I wanted to say hi to Matt. He remembers me from the university. I worked in HR, made sure he got paid. <laughs> I but, sure do. <laughs> uh, I like your tie. Well, thank you. My wife gave me this tie. Oh, oh well, good she did good. Tie. She did <laughs> good. Now, on the 14th, the town is having their election regarding our town meeting that we've had, we've delayed. I know this isn't a question that everybody might be interested, but we will be having a meeting on the Saturday. How do we, or what do we do if more than 50 people come? Well, that's a great question. To the town meeting, you mean, or to the election? To the town meeting. Uh, town meeting, yes. That's a good question. Um, I know the governor has issued an executive order around some of the social distancing rules. Been a lot of questions about town meetings and town elections, which, we, as you know, we don't oversee. Right. Um, I'm, I'm scheduled to moderate a couple of town meetings this month. Um, they're in big school gymnasiums. Both, well, one's in a gymnasium, one's in an old church. Um, it, I think I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question, quite frankly. I think we have to look at the executive order. Okay. Um, see what the governor stipulated for town meetings. All and, right. And then maybe uh, get back to you that way. But I can certainly, I can track you down now, Brenda. Yes, I, I know you can. 
and I can get that answer. I can get you that answer. Well, I'm the town warden uh, for the event, and so I just wanted to be sure. That's all. Well, then, then we're going to make sure you get the answer before the end of the week. Oh, good. Thank you. I appreciate that. You are very welcome. Thank you for a great question. See, I told you somebody would stump me. No, no. <laughs> I think a lot of people have that question as you know we move back into um, regular life. Um, yeah. Does anyone else have a question or want to say something? Just kind of do this, and I'll unmute you. Um, the thing, is, the trick is, is you have to have your video on for me to see you raise your hand, um, which is tricky because some of you don't, and that's fine. Um, just unmuting myself, I'll say, for those of you who can see the chat, I just threw in there a link to request an absentee ballot from the Maine Secretary of State's website if you didn't already have that link. You can also request one by contacting your town office, but there's also a link. That's really helpful, Jessica. Thank you. And um, I'm going to be sending out a follow-up email to all of you, and I will include that link as well in case you're not quick on the draw. Um, and I'll also send out the, um, the link for you to fill out your census online. I did it a couple of weeks ago. It was so easy. Um, it was a piece of cake and it's really important as, as Matt had pointed out. Um, I think if nobody else has any questions or comments. I can't believe you want questions. How about accusations? I'll take those too. <laughs> Recriminations, blame. This is a friendly meeting. Of, 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 of neighbors. So yeah, we're not, you know, this is a friendly meeting. So I, I will say that. Um, hey, I, oops, could I speak? Absolutely. Go right ahead. Hi. Hi, Matt. Uh, this is Joe Pickering from Maine is for Open Elections. We, I lived in uh, Washington State, and you had made some reference to it regarding um, re, re, regarding uh, we, we, we would take 15 years for Maine to move towards a, uh, oh no, no, the Washington State took 15 years. Uh, one of the beauties of, wa of an open primary is this. You do not, when you go to register, you do not register as a voter. Excuse me, you do not register as a, a, a party. You register as a, as a voter. And I honestly believe that, that unless uh, what we have now, and I don't mean to be offensive, but what we have now is what I would call party democracy, in which the parties control ballot access, and that with 38% of all independents, 38% are, are, are in, of all the entire voting bloc of Maine are independents, and many of those people do not want to join a party in order to vote for the you know, vote. And, and furthermore, there was a study that was conducted by uh, my little organization and uh, uh, the national organization, uh, Open Primaries, in which it would show that 80 percent of all Mainers wanted to see more open primaries. And I know that it's difficult to change, but if we're going to really, truly bring liberty, bring greater uh, voter, voter freedom and greater uh, ch uh, choice and greater candidates. And, to, uh, you know, we need to open up this primary. And I know it's the easiest thing to do to retain control. But I think that the first three words in our, our, uh, in our Constitution are not we the party, but we the people. So I hope, Matt, and I hope the governor... And, and I hope the entire legislature will move towards open primaries because otherwise party, the way we're conducting elections in Maine is, 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 is an unfortunate, is unfortunate for independence. It's unfortunate for the people of Maine. And I think in the end, it's going to cause great problems for our parties. It's much better for the parties to participate in our elections, but not control them. Thank, Thank you. you so, Thank you for that comment. I, I don't find that at all offensive, actually. I think uh, in many ways you're, you're dead on. You know, some years ago we were asked to cut a bunch of money out of our budget. 
And it was not tongue in cheek. We actually proposed doing away with the primary system. And our argument was, why are we using taxpayer dollars to do a party nomination process? Now, there are a lot of reasons to do it. People like the official process that's overseen by the elections division and the town clerks. You know, um, so basically I got laughed out of the room. But uh, you, you know, the, the whole process, every, no two states actually do this exactly the same way, which is one of the challenges that we face when people do say, well, why can't we do like what Michigan did or New Mexico did? Um, because they have different structures. Um, Maine's laws actually work pretty well. Um, I know that people have an argument about the, about the open versus closed primary. Um, I administer the laws as written and they've written it as a closed primary and that's what we do. But I wanna go back to something else, uh, get away from uh, Joe for a second and go back to Brenda's question because I found the executive order. Believe it or not, I can multitask. How do you like me so far? So uh, executive order number 56, uh, uh, 1B, a town meeting, budget hearing or public hearing on county estimates may be conducted within the current 50 person gathering limitation in a manner so as to preserve the right to debate and the right to vote, but also protecting the public health by preserving social distancing and restricting shared microphones, restrooms, seating, and observing any gu other guidance prescribed by the main CDC. Alternatively, if such a meeting or hearing cannot be held within main CDC guidance, municipal officers or local officials authorized to call open town meetings, open budget meetings or budget hearings may conduct referenda and or secret ballot elections, including a secret ballot referendum on July 4th, 14th, or such other date cal in calendar year 2020 as the officials may determine. So there's a little bit more of that, but so in, if you don't have a space big enough for your town meeting, you can call an election and do it by secret ballot if you choose to. So that I think uh, uh, may take a little bit of planning, but you don't have to do it on your election day. You can push it off to a later time. I know that a couple of towns have moved their elections to, to September along that line, their town meetings to that time. So um, I would say, um, we, I still wanna talk to you a little bit more about that and make sure you get more detailed information, but that's the general outline of, of that order and what it provides for us. It gives you some alternatives. Thank you for that. Claudia, I saw you waving your hand. Did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, I had a question. Um, the fellow that was talking about the, the open primary, um, and there is a significant proportion of the population that is independent and sort of doesn't get to weigh in in the primary. And I'm wondering, is another vehicle to, um, to try to get an open primary, um, is, could one use the citizens initiative petition process to bring that you know, that forward, and that would avoid trying to find a friendly legislator who might sponsor such a um, piece of legislation. What do you think, Matt? I think that's absolutely the vector that you'd want to explore. Um, the entire citizen initiative process, which was established in the Constitution just before World War I, was part of what they called the progressive era, uh, where you had legislatures across the country. And if you look at the the, the chamber photographs from around that time, um, you, you'd almost think the uniform was to wear a black suit, have a white beard and a bow tie. And um, you, so you're, it was overwhelmed because women didn't have the right to vote. Um, so you know, the, the demographic of what constituted the legislature were typically people who were either retired, wealthy farmers or business people. So the citizen initiative process was really designed to move forward policy proposals that could never get any traction in the legislature. The legislature won't deal with what we the, we the people want, we'll take it on to ourselves. And that's why every bill that is, every chaptered law starts with the same sentence, be it enacted by the people of the state of Maine, instead of the legislature. It used to say be it enacted by the legislature. And now it's by the people of the state of Maine to, to accommodate that. So that would be a vector. Now it's not simple to get a citizen initiative for you. An application with five registered voters. You have to draft up, you have to at least have an idea of what you want the bill to do. It has to be submitted through us to the revisor's office. They have some amount of 15 business days to draft it. And then, then the, 
fiscal office gets 15 business days to come up with a fiscal impact, then we strip up the master petition form and then the, the organization or the group of citizens can take it out into the world. You have to get a number of signatures equivalent to 10% of the turnout in the last election for governor, not in the last election, the number of people who voted in the race for governor. That number right now for the next uh, two years is 63,067 signatures verified by the town clerks, submitted to the Secretary of State, not later than either the 50th day after the convening of the first regular session or the 25th day after the convening of the second regular session, we have 30 days to certify that effort. And once certified, it is then transmitted to the legislature who has the option of either enacting it as it was written or rejecting it. And then it goes on the ballot. And then the voters have a straight up or down choice on that. Now, once it's enacted, the legislature can treat it like any other statute. They can then amend it. They can repeal it. Um, they've only done that once in our history, to repeal an, an enacted initiated referendum. Um, but they do have that option. So, but that is a vector. That is a vector that you can use to change that um, open primary versus closed primary proposal. We could probably have a whole Zoom meeting about open and closed primaries. Yeah, I mean, that process is actually tattooed on the inside of my Yes, eyes. I'm sure. Um, well, it is almost six o'clock and it's time to end tonight's meeting. I just wanted to thank you, Matt, so much for joining us and sharing this really important information. Thank you, Jessica, for joining me and asking some wonderful questions. And thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Um, we do these events for our readers and for our supporters. So thank you for coming. And um, like I said, I will follow up with an email with some links. Um, and I think there were probably some people who didn't get a chance to ask their questions and may have some questions they didn't want to ask publicly. Um, <laughs> and you can put in the links, um, you know, my direct email address. It is matthew.dunlap at maine.gov. And I'm happy to give that out also as a Bangor Daily News subscriber. <laughs> Thank you so much. We do have another event um, this week that I wanted to just mention real quick. Um, we'll be meeting with people from the Good Shepherd Food Bank and the United Way of Eastern Maine to talk about how they have had to change their services and offerings because of COVID-19. And we have a really great lineup for the rest of the month. You can check us out on Facebook or just open up the emails that we send you. And check out our website for new features about the election. Absolutely. So thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful night, and I hope to see you again soon.